Welcome everybody to the Tank Museum. My name is Bismarck and I host the Military Aviation History channel on YouTube. Now I'm here to show you my top five tanks, but since I don't know much about these vehicles, I as a German came prepared and bought myself a cheat set. Now I base my choice mainly on the utility of tanks as a scout vehicle and using them in airborne operations. So let's get started. Right, we're standing in front of my first choice. This is the American M22 Locust. This is a light tank designed by Marmon and Harrington and it was supposed to be air transportable. To do this, it was really a two-stage process. You would take off the turret, you would place this inside a C-54 Skymaster and then you use these hooks here to strap the whole hull uh, under the fuselage of the aircraft. Obviously this means that this tank cannot be dropped into combat but actually has to be placed back together wherever you brought it to. When this tank came out, even though it was kind of a revolutionary idea, it was already out of date. This was 1943 we're talking and something like this was just not going to cut it any longer. So the Americans said, we don't want this, who wants it? The Brits said, yes, we'll have it. Let's give it a shot. Now the Brits had a plan. They were going to use the Locust and drop it into combat in their Hamilcar gliders. The Hamilcar glider was big enough to accommodate this tiny tank and this provided the solution that the Americans had not. When it was dropped into combat, it was supposed to put the 37mm cannon and its coax machine gun to good use and make sure that the Germans keep their heads down. However, the combat record during the Rhine crossing when these tanks were in fact used was less than stellar. Transporting the uh, Locust into combat was also somewhat difficult. Uh, this is a 7-ton tank, even though it's quite small and it doesn't have that much armor, 23mm roughly. It was still 7 tons. And if the Hamilcar glider came to a sudden stop, well, it might just come out the front end of it. All of that said, the Locust represents a courageous effort of actually giving the boys in the field a tank to drop into combat with them. And that's why it deserves to be on my top five list. Now, if the Locust deserves to be on my list, so does the Tetrarch. This is the first British airborne tank. And here at the Tank Museum, it is in fact in its natural environment, since it is exhibited inside a Hamilcar glider. Well, the fuselage is slightly wrecked, but you can see how much of a tight squeeze it actually is and how much of a nightmare it is to transport a tank like this. However, the Tetrarch was used during combat and during Normandy landings it supported the paratroopers in northern France. Uh, for this role it was given a two-pounder, this is a 40mm cannon, and a machine gun to, well, shoot at the Germans, I guess. Uh, in the Boffington Tank Museum here we have a uh, Tetrarch with a uh, free inch howitzer, however, so this is an experimental version and makes it all more exciting. Uh, one of the things that really impressed me with the Tetrarch is that, in fact, if you put it into a turn, the tracks bend as it goes along into the direction you uh, wanted the tank to go. So this is a nice little uh, feature on the tank, I guess. Now, one of the things we should point out is that even though this is a light tank, it still weighs seven to eight tons, which complicates the transport by glider somewhat. Once it gets into a fight, the crew of three is protected by 16 millimeters of armor. Now, when the tank was designed in 1949, this was pretty cool. In 1944, being dropped into a combat zone in Normandy, where every bush camping German has access to a Panzerfaust, things suddenly look a lot different. Because the Tetrarch represents once again a valiant attempt of dropping a tank into combat, it once again deserves to be on my top five list. Let's go over to my next choice. This is the FV703, also known as the Ferret and it inherits a position in the British tradition of the scout car in the post-World War II period. It is following the concept of the scout car pretty much to the letter. It is small, it is stealthy, it is speedy, and it can go anywhere at any time. And this really gives the army and the boys on the ground a vehicle that can do a scouting in the hinterlands, on the front lines, and wherever you wish to do it. The thing that really impresses me about Ferret is its speed. It can go on road uh, up to 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, that's for you Imperials out there, 60 miles an hour. So this thing can do some serious speed. All right, let's turn to Ferret's weaponry. It has, of course, a rifle caliber machine gun, which is pretty good for close defense, but that's pretty much all it can do. 
However, the Brits gave this scout car some serious firepower with the introduction of two vigilant missile launchers on the side of the turret in the mid-1960s. And these missiles can knock out an MVT at a range of roughly 1,400 meters. So essentially it takes the concept of a scout car and says, right, let's drive softly but carry a big gun. Now while this introduction of the missile uh, does open the uh, scout car's options, the uh, introduction still has practical limits because right now the scout car is of course supposed to do a certain task and that is scout, reconnoiter and tell your own guys where the enemy is at. These missiles are a serious temptation for any kind of ferret commander who sees a MBT just strolling along a field in front of him. Even though they can be launched with pretty much no flash and bang, you still have to wait roughly 12 seconds for an impact at maximum range. And in that time, you could be spotted and under fire. And since they're wire guided, you can't really move until the, uh, the uh, missile hits. So it's a good idea and it works in some situations, but it also has some serious flaws. Now, for all the practical limitations the ferret has with these vigilant missiles, I actually kind of like the idea of placing such a powerful weapon on such a small, unobtrusive vehicle. And that's why it's number three in my top five tanks. Next one up the list, it's the Daimler Armored Car. Now, I really like this vehicle, again, for multiple reasons. First of all, it looks great. Then it's a scout vehicle. It can go fast, 90 kilometers an hour again roughly 50 to 60 miles an hour and it has some good firepower it's a 20 a two pounder gun that could be adapted with a little john adapter and this gun can do some pretty good damage against uh, soft armor targets but also against some more armored uh, vehicles now what really makes this uh, vehicle shine is the transmission and uh, it has a very fancy kind of setup. And in fact, the Brits here out-engineered the Germans and made it work. So what it has, it has five speeds forward and five speeds backwards. That means that the driver, who's obviously facing forward, can go at full speed and if need be, stop. And then the commander in the back, who has a little steering wheel, can go five uh, speeds backwards at the same speed. And that is pretty damn cool for a little vehicle like this, in my opinion, and that's why it's on my top five list. And now we are at my number one choice. And this tank has quite a long name, so I hope you have your clipboard ready. This is the Panzerkampfwagen 2 Ausführung L Lux. It is a German light tank from the mid to late war period. And it is based, of course, on the Panzer II. This tank started uh, production in September 1943 and it was supposed to be used mainly on the Eastern Front. This is of course the reason why the Germans opted for a track design for a scout vehicle. However, the strange choice they had is that they had overlapping road wheels, which were somewhat problematic when it comes to the mud. However, it is quite a nifty vehicle. It has a Maybach engine pumping out roughly 200 horsepower and that allows it to go 60 kilometers an hour. This for a tank its size and for the purposes that it was built for is actually pretty good. Now it houses a crew of four and is protected by 30 millimeters of armor. Now what makes this tank so special to me is the gun. This is the Kampfwagenkanone 38, a 20 millimeter cannon. And this weapon is pretty much seen throughout the war on the German side. Uh, it derives out of the Kampfwagenkanone 30 and uh, shares a family tree with the uh, Flakkanone 30 and Flakkanone 38, which obviously were designed to shoot down aircraft, which is why this makes me this, this gun so special for me. Um, also, one of the members of that family tree is in fact the Solofern ST5, which the Germans redesignated as C-30. And that cannon, that 20mm cannon, was one of the first 20mm cannons that was actually mounted in an aircraft. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, there was certain a rivalry between Heinkel and Messerschmitt. Heinkel provided the Heinkel 112 and uh, Messerschmitt, of course, the BF-109. And they were competing against each other which company would give the frontline fighter for the Germans. And Heinkel decided to place the uh, C-30 uh, cannon in a Heinkel 112, send it off to Spain, and there it, in fact, insisted in the destruction of an armored train and a few armored cars. 
and uh, before it would uh, continue its service, actually it crashed and uh, destroyed itself. And as such, uh, that experiment essentially failed. Now, because I like the look of this tank and because this gun is so ubiquitous in its service for the German Armed Forces, this is my top tank. That was my top five. I hope you enjoyed them. Don't forget to subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and to support them on Patreon. Also make sure to check out my channel, Military Aviation History, and to check out my Patreon. As always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky. And now, we wait for the Stukas.